Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edward Hector. I'm president of PartyPale.com. PartyPale is an online retailer of party supplies. We operate seven different website properties devoted to different sort of celebration styles. But the, I think probably the most valuable part of me being here for you guys isn't the fact that I'm an online retailer. It's the fact that in my prior life, I ran a company that built over 500,000 websites for small businesses, primarily brick and mortar establishments, retailers, restaurants, auto repair shops, and managed a very uh, effective team that helped put hundreds of thousands of people online and learned an awful lot about what it took to be successful while we also built e-commerce websites for other businesses and saw the sort of the differences between what do you need to be successful in supporting a, what I would call a terrestrial business, a business with an actual physical presence, and what do you need to be successful online? I guess the first question I'd like to start with, just show of hands, how many people have a website for their business today? So vast majority. How many of you sell product online? So a few. Um, so that's good to know. So I'm a member of the Party Club of America group. And a lot of the members have come up to me over the years and said, so how do I become successful selling online? It looks like it would be really easy. And my first question is, how many people do you have in your marketing department? So just show a hands. How many people here have a marketing department with more than 10 people in it? How many have a marketing department with more than five people in it? How many people have one dedicated person with a title of marketing director or marketing manager? Okay, and so it's just one? All right, so when you think about trying to go online and compete, and you think about an organization our size, and we're kind of tiny in the online world, um, I've got eight people devoted to online marketing. And so the idea of being able to try and say, hey, you know what, I want to get online and I want to compete against PartyCity.com and PartyPale.com and Birthday Direct and Birthday Express, that's a daunting task. And it requires a whole different set of skills. But in my background, I'd make the argument that your customers are unique in your, each of your markets. And your ability to leverage the internet is different than mine. And there are things that you can do to attract customers and retain them online that can really benefit your business. And it doesn't have to it, and it doesn't have to be expensive. So. January 2013, 43 million times. Let me repeat that, 43 million, that's not a typo. There will be a search done on Google this month in the United States that will include the term party, costume, or birthday. But not all of those searches are party supply free shipping. A lot of them are gonna be party supply store, Houston, Texas or Niles, Ohio. They're gonna have some sort of prefix or suffix to the search that's gonna suggest a location. And when you look at what Google knows about us, they know an awful lot, more than you might guess. More maybe you might guess and you know, Big Brother's watching everything. But they know where we are. And they're gonna respond for common requests to present you search results that are based upon where you're actually located. So, internet's changing advertising. Advertising is forever different than it was before the internet. How many people still use a yellow pages, an actual thick book yellow pages to find things? How many people here advertise in the yellow pages? Okay. It's interesting because one of the things that I did years ago is I worked with Yahoo, helping Yahoo do listings, sell advertising in their online yellow page. And it was interesting to start trying to sell that product and see how businesses would react to advertising online in a yellow page directory. But the reality is people like Yahoo and Google and yellowpages.com and Verizon, they invest a lot of money in trying to find ways to get their online yellow page directories ranking. And yet, we all come home and see the, 
the yellow page book sitting in our mailbox and we're generally walking right by the recycle bin on the way into the house and dropping it in because we all search generally for things online now, right? Newspapers have changed. Catalogs have changed. And they've all been transformed by what's going on in the internet. And what's happening with the competitors that you have out in the marketplace has also changed. You're seeing some things going on in mass merchandise and specialty, some of the big box shops, even some of the clubs, where there's the club stores where they're starting to participate in party. And then you've got guys like the online retailers and even Amazon and others that are competing with you. And then, of course, you have your traditional brick and mortar competitor, the party supply store that might be in the next town or the next county, somewhere's on the commute line for your customers between their home and their work that you're competing with. And so the question that I'm, I put forth when people ask me about, gosh, how do I get online, and they think e-commerce, my question is to come back up and say, how do we attempt to get competitive online without having to burden a 10-person marketing department to try and build an e-commerce business? How can you simply find a way to make yourself visible and do something that benefits your business instead of making an investment that might be very difficult to get a good return on investment on? So I've, kind of tr I've thought about this, and I tried to keep this as absolutely um, streamlined as I could in terms of what would define success for a typical brick-and-mortar retailer. The first is un you need to understand how and why people search. So how many people here have a smartphone? Vast majority. So that's changing radically the internet world in terms of how and why and when people search. The second thing is, is understand how search engines like Google or Yahoo or Bing, how do they look at your website and figure out what does your website really tell them? And then the third thing is to really think about what are the real world benefits you can deliver to your clients through the website that are appropriate for the amount of investment that you make. So let's talk a little bit about how and why people search. So what generally I've found is that the farther away from the event, the more generic the searches are and the more inspirational the searches are. So someone who's planning a baby shower, they're searching three months in advance of the event for something like ideas for baby shower themes. They don't know whether or not they're doing ladybug or they're doing lambs or they're doing rubber duckies. They're out there searching for ideas. I would make the that that search is probably not a search you should try and compete for. That's not a customer yet. That's somebody who is at best a browser and really is a researcher. Now, there's a very different kind of search that probably is the sort of search that might be very interesting to you. Somebody who types in the search term, Houston Party Supplies. Now, that starts to tell us a couple of things. The fact that, A, they've entered an actual uh, city name starts to suggest that this is somebody who is looking for some place to go. And if they're looking for some place to go, it probably means they're looking for something to buy. That first search is not a buyer. The second search is a buyer. And so the goal with websites is to make sure that your website doesn't show up for the things that you don't want and does show up for the things that you do. So you might think a search term like baby shower supplies, free shipping would be a great term for you to rank for. Well, the reality is the person typing that, that phrase in is probably in their fuzzy slippers at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to place an order. So again, you have to make the decision. Do I want my website to rank for a term like that or be found when someone searches on that? Now, sometimes people are actually looking for you. They're actually, you know what? I want to find Party On in Niles, Ohio. And they're actually looking for a specific company name. So you want to keep all this in mind as you start to get through website design processes and start to try and become effective. We'll dive into this in a little bit more detail here. So this is a page that you guys have all looked at before. It's a typical Google search page. And I'm going to try and use my pointer here to kind of point out some of the elements on this page so you, that you understand where people are, are sort of ranking for things. So I was working with a, with, um, a PCA member. Uh, they were in, they're in Olean, New York. And we were sort of doing some research to see how visible they were online. 
And so I said, great, let's go ahead and type in the term party supplies only in New York. And, new, and Google brought back this page. And the page includes things like Google Maps. You see right over here? Here's a map, and on it there's little pins. And those pins relate to this part of the page. And these are what are called Google Places. And those Google Places are essentially a way for you to have a directory listing at Google that tells Google, I have a business, I'm open these hours, here's my website, and here's my address. And they're smart enough to know, hey, you're a party supply company, you're located in Houston, Texas. If somebody searches for party supplies in Houston, Texas, the typical response from Google is to show a map and show pins on the map of where those party supply stores are. The way that you show up there is to make sure you have a Google Places account. The second part of the search page is this right here. This is what people call organic search results. This is when you talk about getting ranked. Those are the pages that you want to be on. And this is where Google has gone out and actually looked at your website and said, you know what, this is the right result to show somebody searching. The third component of the page that you need to know about is here. These are ads. These are paid advertisements. And this is going to be, in this example here, we had Birthday Express, we had Party City, we had Birthday Direct. These are all people who are buying a search term, probably the term party supplies. And if you click on that ad, it's going to cost them somewhere between 10 and 50 cents. They've bid for that. And their position on that page is based on the bid. So there's paid advertising on this page. There's non-paid visibility on this page. And really, the reality is somebody searching locally probably isn't concerned about these guys over here. They're going to look at what's at the very top of the page and decide, is that important to me? Now, one thing to note here is, look, I'm from Seattle. So when I did this search and captured this screen, Google knew that I was in Seattle. So if I dropped the expression only in New York off of that search and just typed in party supplies, Google likely at that point in time would serve up a combination of national results and local results, guessing that, it, that I might be interested in the local result. And so based on my city, it might choose to, to highlight a Seattle-based party supply company in the list. So the question then is, great, well, how do I get my website to show up in these things? That's great. I want someone typing in, you know, party supplies Seattle. And I want, if I'm in Seattle, I want my website to pop up. So Google and Yahoo and Bing, they crawl your pages. They crawl your website. And they look at things in the programming of your site, the content and the titles and things. And they even look at the images. Now you're thinking, how can they see the image? They can't. But what they can see is what you put for a description of the image. And they can interpret that and say, ah, they're saying this piece of this image here that's 300 pixels wide and 300 pixels tall is actually a picture of balloons. And so if you say party balloon decorator as the title of that image, they now know what that image is. So they're looking at the page and they're saying, what are all of these things that are on the page that can help me figure out one page of the website versus another versus another? We'll, we'll x-ray a page here in a second. I'll show you a little bit more detail. The second thing they look for are votes about your website. So what they're looking for are people who link to your website. And there's a couple of different ways people might link to it. They might Facebook share you or tweet about your account. There might be a directory, a yellow page directory, or a local directory that has a link to your website. Each one of those links, if they're coming from a credible website that they already respect, is a vote of trust. And that trust gives them the confidence to say, I'm going to rank them higher. So there's some really great local regional directories that you can get your website listed in. Probably your Better Business Bureau, uh, local chambers of commerce. There's a, uh, something called Patch. They're not all across the country, but I think they're in about 200 major cities. Patch.com, you can build a little patch profile. You can build a Google profile. There's a number of different ways to sort of get links pointed at you that give them signals that say, this is a site you should trust. So here's a company, Party On, Niles, Ohio. Anybody know these guys? Good, I can say all sorts of terrible things about them and they'll never know. 
uh, actually Jeff and Debbie know him well, uh, cohorts and friends through Party Club of America. So here's a website that I look at and say, I love this site. Now, this is not a site they spent $150,000 designing. This was a simple site built by a local web designer, and it's elegant in that it accomplishes the tasks. When someone visits the page, they know what they do, they easily can see contact information. Visita visiting this website can very quickly result in a phone call or a visit to their store. And that's the goal here, is people are searching, and how do you keep that chain of the search going until it ends up with a contact that you can actually sell something with? So again, with the magic pointer here, at the very top, whoop, at the very top, there's something called a page title. And that's in the very top of the search bar. You really can't see it here. But generally, most people would think, well, I'm going to put my company name there. That little title at the top is the single most important thing Google looks at. So there, there's, it says, party on, party supplies, and it lists the cities that they're in. Very logical. There are other elements on the page. They're basically saying, hey, we're an Ohio party supply store. We serve all of these markets. We provide all of these products. But this thing here is a head, and so they've actually programmed it on its page. It's called an H1. And they're telling Google, this is an important term. I want you to pay attention to it. This image that's here for St. Patrick's Day actually says party supplies for all sorts of seasons, including this great pork, you know, uh, St. Patty's Day uh, uh, ensemble. And so they've used all of the code capabilities to sort of tell Google what this website is actually about. Now, when I first started working with them on this project, this is what their website looked like. Their title said, party on, we get the party started. No reference to Ohio, no re re references to any of the cities that they operate in. Now that means instead of competing with everybody in their cities, they're now competing nationwide. And now they're trying to displace any of the big major players instead of getting very targeted and having Google think, yeah, that's what we want to display for a particular category. The next thing you'll notice here is, see this right here, this party on? This was a picture. That was not text. So how does Google figure out what that picture is? If I'm visiting the site, I know that's a phone number, but Google couldn't read it. All it saw was an image that was 600 characters wide by 200 characters high. And nothing about it that said, this is my address and phone number. So while that works for the user, Google had no clue what it was. There was no content that you can really see on the page, uh, and the images didn't have any attributes on them. And so there were all kind of these standardized things that Google looks for that really weren't there. So this looks very much like this. Same website designer. The designer, to make the changes that we recommended, it took them less than an hour. I think their web de designer charged them 150 bucks. $150 was the difference between them having a website that told Google what they do and a website that didn't. So we worked with them on that. We looked at, and, and we started by asking, so what cities do you serve? Oh, well, we serve do, 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 do. These are all the local communities that are nearby my stores. Great, we need to have that listed on the site. What departments do you have that are major in your store? Well, we're balloon decorators, and we do this, and we do that. Great, we need to tell people about that on the site. And you just tell them, like you're writing a letter to your friend. Hey, this is what we do. We do blah, 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 blah. Google's pretty smart. They're going to figure it out. They're going to read the page, and they're going to do something with it. So we fixed kind of the page elements, and then we went out, and we just said, hey, let's get a couple of links pointing at the site. You remember the Chamber of Commerce? Yeah, let's get a link from them. Let's get our listing in the Chamber of Commerce to have a little link back to the website. Are you a Better Business Bureau member? Are you, do you have a Google Places account? So now, beforehand, they, they weren't able to be found. Now when you search for Party On, um, in this example here, I can't really see at the top here, I think it says uh, Austinville or it says Niles, Ohio, they're dominating the page. So here's this paid ad that somebody paid they rank number one here, and their directory listing ranks. So they're over here on the pin. They have 80% of the real estate at the top of the page. So if you've got a mobile phone, and you just did that search, almost the only thing you're seeing is them. 
Now that's what invites a telephone call or someone to walk through the door. That generates business. It's a question of how do you get yourself visible and be prepared when the opportunity arises that someone says, I need those supplies now. Because if somebody needs the supplies now, they're not going online. They're going to go right now. So beforehand, they ranked, so this is sort of a comparison of how they were ranking at Google, what position they had within Google. And this was only after eight weeks of work. Beforehand, we could only find seven terms that they ranked for, and their average position was the bottom of the second page of Google. How many people here get to the second page of Google when you're searching for something? Almost nobody. So our goal was how do we get them up a little bit higher? So their average position now is, uh, they're averaging around position five or position six, but what's neat is on the really cr critical terms, like party supplies and the town names, they're ranking between first and third for everything. They're visible as can be. Now, one of the things was they thought they were being clever by party on. Anybody seen Wayne, Wayne's World? We analyzed the traffic coming to their website. 80% of the traffic getting before this, the only search term was party on. And a lot of it was party on dude. That's not, I mean, it creates traffic, but that's not a lead. That's not a sales opportunity. Somebody in Canada searching for Wayne's World uh, cliches does not translate to a business opportunity for us. So we started redirecting, telling Google, it's not just what you tell them what you are, but it's as much what you tell them that you aren't. And that was really a really fun, unexpected element here is that the site traffic, how many visitors that got to the site went way up, but the type of visitor was radically different. They're actual customers. So the two kind of elements here are be in position, understand why people search and how, understand how you compete and therefore what you want to be ranked for. If you don't have a balloon decorating department, don't say you have a balloon decorating department because that's going to turn people off. You want to make that telephone ring. You want to make that door swing. And then there's the next part of the internet and how you can market. And that's how do you get people to engage after the sale? How do you add value in their lives so that they become a repeat customer, a customer for life? And that's where you start transitioning from what you do with your website to what you do with social media and email and things like that. So. How many people here have Facebook pages, business pages? OK, so about 3 quarters of the hands dropped when I said business pages. So personal pages are a great starting point. If you know how to use Facebook, Google actually is starting to treat business pages like websites. And so I actually know some people now that have abandoned using a website, and they use Facebook as their business website. And they're actually get, able to get it to rank. But the neat thing about social media is it's a way for you to interact with a customer. So one of the things that we've found in operating our business Facebook page is posts can do two things. Post, you can make a post on Facebook and it gets shared and people, you end up with new people that are fans and liking your site. You have other times that you send out a post and it causes a bunch of people to go unfriend. And you've now destroyed your brand equity. So the rule is only send this post, if this is a post you would really want to receive yourself, add value. So using Facebook to do nothing but 20% off sale or get this free or do that, that's not adding value in most people's worlds. Sending a funny Friday cartoon is a far better way to engender loyalty with your customer than sending them a coupon, at least when you're interacting with them online. So there's a lot of do's that I recommend. You know, you're going to want to monitor your reputation out there. If someone complains on your Facebook page, the first thing you need to do is not delete the post. It's respond in a professional way. And use that feedback that says, hey, thank you for pointing that out. We want to get better at this. I'd like to message you directly and figure out how we can do something to help you out with this. 
and get the communication offline, start engaging them, but it, use it to get feedback. Be positive, and most importantly, keep your business and personal separate. How many times have we seen naked pictures from celebrities online because they don't know how to control the difference between what they're texting to their friend and posting to their Twitter account? Crazy, but it happens, so keep it, keep it separate. But don't, some don'ts here. Once you decide to put yourself out there and say, I'm gonna expose myself to the world through Facebook or the internet, you're now on the hook to deliver great results and great service. Because if you don't, you're gonna hear about it. And everyone else who visited your pages are gonna hear about it. So you need to be prepared to deliver the best possible service to withstand the kind of scrutiny that consumers are gonna throw at you through this. And they may not be reasonable in their expectations, so you have to be unreasonable in the quality of service you give. Don't ignore posts, don't go on only once a month, that's not gonna really get you anywhere, you really need to make a commitment to this. And don't set up incorrect contact information. If you change the telephone number on your business, Think through changing it on all your directory listings and your website and your Facebook page and places like that. So, does anybody here have an email list with your customers on? Email your customers? How many people use their register space with an email sign-up list of the guys who do that? Okay, so you guys are doing a good job with that. Um, email marketing, I, I actually think that email marketing is one of the best ways of interacting with customers afterwards, if you learn enough about them to time what you send and when you send. So how many people ask for the birth date of their children on the email page, setup page? Does anybody do that? If you, if you don't, you should. You should know the birth dates of everybody in their family. You should know the anniversary dates if you can. You should know if their children are in school at a certain grade. Wouldn't you want to send a, a graduation email to somebody who's got a child that's graduating? Wouldn't you want to send an email to someone a month in advance of the birthday saying, hey, we have a special gift for you. Thanks for being a customer. We'd like to do a consultation to help you design your birthday party. Come on in. We'll give you $20 off an order over $100. A lot of moms, a lot of families are going to respond to that kind of personal communication. The mass once a month, $10 off or 50% off thing. How many of us get gazillions of those every day? We have to separate ourselves from the crowd. Now the don'ts in email are ju just, it's golden rule stuff. Don't spam. Don't broadcast their privacy information. Don't copy everybody in every email to everybody else. It's some really basic stuff. It's golden rule stuff. And of course that whole personal business thing, you gotta keep that separate because that can come back to bite you. So, the final thing that I'll share with you, it's, it's kind of one of the fundamentals of how I run my, my business. You can't manage what you don't measure. If you don't measure it or you can't measure it, you're not managing it, you're hoping, you're wishing it, but you're not really managing it. So you have to be able to understand what's your website doing for you. So some of the things I recommend is, People are saying, well, I can't tell how my website's working for me. Well, the, the sort of things that you can do is, well, how do we track the number of phone calls we generate from those listings, those directory listings? And how do we track the number of phone calls that come from our website? It's actually very easy. For $10 a month, you can sign up with an 800 service that you get a separate phone number that goes on your directory listings and your website, and it auto-forwards to your business. And then you can just check. How many phone calls did I get off of that every month? It's a really simple, easy way to measure is my website being effective or not. You, you should always install web monitoring or web analytics tools to see who's visiting your site, what search term did they use to get there, and where did they come from? Did they come from Google? Did they come from Yahoo? Did they come from a referral from some other website? These sort of tools help you understand what's going on on your site and how to modify that, that site to be as best as possible for them and translate results. And then of course, you should be asking everybody where they heard about you at your business, keeping a log. 
So you can tell, was it the website that did it? Was it a flyer that did it? Was it the guy standing in the costume out on the street corner? Understand what's working for him. So when I think about e-commerce, I think about entirely different things. When I think about websites for retail businesses, for me, it's really down to a couple of real basic things. One is, what content am I pushing out onto the internet? And how do I make my website readable and rich in the eyes of the search engines? I then need to find out how I tell the search engines that I exist. What directories am I in? How do I get people pointing links at us? And then the final thing is, is how do I engage with my customers after they become a customer? Because that's the difference between a one-time client and a lifelong loyal customer that's really going to be profitable for you. That's what I think about in the brick and mortar world for websites and what they can do and how they can do it. And I'm, I'm passionate about it because of my prior life. I saw what this could do to businesses. And you think about how many people traveling at this show use their phones to find a restaurant or a referral someplace or a taxi or something. I mean, this is the world we live in. So we can't ignore it. We've got to find a way to learn the basics and only enough that we to, to accomplish what we need and then don't in, overinvest in it. That's the, probably the biggest thing I see is people spending almost too money on website stuff and too, too much money and not enough time to do it. And so with that, I would say thank you for your time. Wish you the best of success with the show. And if I can be of any service to you, please feel free to come up and see me after the, after the talk.